Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, My name is Nick, and I am a grateful, recovering member of Al-Anon. And I came into Al-Anon in November of 2002, this time. Uh, I I don't have the date. I didn't think it was important when I came in. I never paid much attention, so... But, uh... I want to thank Dave and Stuart for inviting me down here. Uh, I'd like to thank Laura. She's been a wonderful host. Uh, I'd like to thank Jody, uh, who Jody is going to drop me off at the airport tomorrow. (laughs) And that's important. And, And I'd like to thank... Carrie, who picked me up at the airport. So, uh, you know, a couple years ago, I heard Jerry Jones, one of your native Texans, speak. And he talked about Texas hospitality. And, you know, I never understood what he was talking about until I experienced it. I've been treated so very well since I've been here. So I, I thank you. Uh, I love Al-Anon, and I love AA. And you know, Al-Anon grew out of AA. In 1951, Bill Wilson had a handful of correspondence from what was known as the AA Auxiliary. And he gave them to his wife, Lois, and said, Lois, why don't you do something with these? And so Lois and a lady by the name of Ann B. started Al-Anon. And they took AA's 12 steps, they took AA's 12 traditions, they took AA's responsibility statement, they uh, took the AA symbol and turned it inside out and put the triangle on the outside. They even took the name Alcoholics Anonymous and shortened it, made it Al-Anon. Why, if it wasn't for alcoholics, we wouldn't even have a program. Nor would we need one. (laughs) I'm going to start out with a little story about a sober member of AA. And he was out on a blind date with a, a young lady, and they were at a restaurant. The waiter came over and said, could I get you something to drink? And She said, I'll have a glass of wine, and he said, I'll have a glass of water. And she said, aren't you getting a drink? And he said, no, I I don't drink. And she, he said, she said, not ever. And he said, no, I'm a sober member of AA, and I, I don't ever drink. And she said, not even on special occasions. And he said, no, I I don't drink at all. And she said, well, what would happen if you'd reach across this table and take this glass of wine and drink it? And he said, well, let me paint you a picture. (laughs) You wake up in the morning. You don't know where you are. You don't know how you got there. One of your shoes is missing. Your your keys are gone. You don't know where your car is. And your wallet's empty. And she said, is that what would happen to you if you had one drink? He said, no, that's what would happen to you if I had one drink. (laughs) Because you see... We are badly affected by somebody else's drinking. Uh, You know, we're all very different people here today. Uh, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 
and that makes me a Steeler fan. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in the minority, but I wanted to get that out of the way right from the start. Uh, but we're all very different people. If I was to stand up here and share my political views, it'd probably make the hair on the back of some of your necks stand on end. Uh, I was a construction worker for 40 years. And as there's mostly women here, I'm guessing that most of you weren't. <laughs> uh, I'm also guessing I have different religious affiliations than a lot of you. We all have different levels of education. I had a friend who was telling his sponsor how smart he was because he had a degree in this, a degree in that, and a degree in this other thing. And his sponsor explained to him that they put degrees on rectal thermometers, and you know where we stick them. <laughs> I'm probably older than a lot of you. I tell people I'm in my fourth quarter. <laughs> Although there are those that insist I'm in sun death. I don't know. <laughs> but we come from different races, different ethnic backgrounds. We have different amounts of wealth. We have uh, different lifestyles, different living standards, different intellects. Some of us... Uh, uh, we, we all have different, uh, different amounts of time in the program. Uh, we have different likes and dislikes. We live in different communities. Some of us are even of different sexes. The point is that we're all very different people. And if we talk about anything other than recovery from the disease of alcoholism at our meetings, we leave somebody out of the conversation. Uh, we're not here today to celebrate our triumphs. We're here because of our failures, our defeats. Our brokenness is what bonds us together. You know, I went on in AA, the only place I know that you can meet a total stranger and sit down and reminisce. <laughs> I lived with alcoholism for years, and I had no clue what it was. I thought it was a moral issue. I thought an alcoholic was somebody who lived under a bridge and drank out of a paper bag. And I certainly wouldn't have somebody like that living in my house, let alone sleeping in my bed. But I did. I'm here today to share my experience, strength, and hope. And my experience, simply put, was that my wife drank and I got brain damage. I don't know how that happens. <laughs> I come from a family of drinkers. Everybody in my family drinks. That was normal to me. I thought it was normal for everyone. In fact, my mother told me when I was 13 years old that you can't trust people that don't drink. <laughs> and I got to tell you, I have met some of the nicest untrustworthy people since I came to Texas. <laughs> anyway, when I was 15 years old, I became trustworthy. And I started drinking. I drank all through high school, and I drank a lot. After high school, I went to a little college in northern Pennsylvania, there was three women for every man that went there. I thought I died and went to heaven. <laughs> After college, I married my college sweetheart. That was one year of college, and she was pregnant. And we had a little girl. Early in my marriage, we struggled financially because I had no marketable skills. Uh, then I got into an electrical apprenticeship, my future was a little more secured, and we had a little boy. Uh, early in our marriage, my wife drank very little. She had three or four glasses of wine a year. My drinking, on the other hand, bothered my wife. If I would stop and have a few beers with my friends, she would get upset. And if we went someplace where they were serving alcohol, she'd count the number of drinks I had because I had to drive home. 
And this went on for the first eight years of our marriage. Then on our eighth wedding anniversary, I said to my wife, what would you like to do to celebrate our anniversary? And my wife said, well, you know, I've never gone to see an X-rated movie. <laughs> well, that sounded like a good idea to me. <laughs> so I took her to see an X-rated movie, and then we went out to dinner. That X-rated movie seemed to have a profound effect upon her. <laughs> Because when we got to the restaurant, I asked her if she wanted a, a drink. She said yes, so I ordered a bottle of wine. That wine was gone before the food was on the table. So I ordered another bottle of wine. By the time supper was finished, she was starting to get a little loud. I figured I'd better get her out of there. So I paid the bill. We stood up to leave. She was a little wobbly. And so I put my arm around her, and we started off across the restaurant. We got about halfway across the restaurant, and she stopped walking. I said, what's the matter? She said, my legs won't work. <laughs> so I picked her up and put her over my shoulder like a saddlebag. <laughs> I carried her out of the restaurant. I carried her to the car. I loaded her in the car. And, you know, I wasn't ashamed or embarrassed. She was starting to act like my family. <laughs> and on the way home, I thought, you know, this is our anniversary. We've gone to see an X-rated movie, and now she's drunk. Tonight's going to be my lucky night. <laughs> she was puking before we got in the door. <laughs> but my wife went from a person who had three or four glasses of wine a year to a person who was falling down drunk seven days a week in six months' time. That's how fast alcoholism grabbed a hold of her. And at first, it didn't bother me. I thought it was great I had someone to party with. But it soon started getting old because she was drunk every night of the week. And I asked her to slow down. She didn't slow down. I demanded that she slow down. She didn't slow down. I pleaded with her. She didn't slow down. I tried to reason with her. She didn't slow down. I even tried to sit and drink with her. That did nothing but piss her off because I was drinking her wine. It didn't slow her down any, though. <laughs> Finally, I started marking bottles so I could point out to her just how much she was drinking. She didn't seem to realize. And when I started marking bottles, we started playing hide-and-seek. She would hide the bottle, and I'd seek it. When I found it, I always dumped it out. And I never got any satisfaction from that, and it wasn't until I came into Alano and someone pointed out to me that I was just dumping money down the drain because she had more wine the next day. I don't know when it started or how it started, but I started to obsess about my wife and her drinking. I mean, it absolutely owned me. I'd go to work, and I'd be thinking about her all day, where she was, who she was with, what she was doing. Was she drinking? Was she buying booze? And I'd come home, and she was perfectly fine because her pattern of drinking was she didn't start drinking until I came home from work. There seemed to be something about me that made her thirsty. <laughs> but by the time I came home from work, <clears throat> I had myself so worked up. And we had many fights. And I got to tell you, I started almost every one of them. And it wasn't that I liked to fight. I just couldn't seem to help myself. And I'd get her all fired up, and I'd want to be done fighting. I'd go in the next room, and she'd be right on my heels like a little Mexican chihuahua. <laughs> and I'd go into the next room, and she'd be right on my heels. And finally, in desperation, just to get away from her, I'd run out and jump in my car and tear off down the street. And I wouldn't even get a block down the street. And I'd say to myself, where are you going? Because I had no place to go, and I had no one to talk to. Living with alcoholism filled me with anger and resentment. 
I was uh, full of frustration. I was full of fear. I was full of guilt. I was full of shame and, and embarrassment. But the worst part about living with alcoholism was the loneliness. There simply was no one I could talk to. And it wasn't that people wouldn't talk to me. I didn't want to talk to them. I didn't want them to know what was going on in my home. We get invited someplace where I knew there was going to be alcohol, and I'd say, oh, we'd love to come. But unfortunately, we have other plans that night. We didn't have any other plans. I was afraid she was going to perform. And so I became a liar. Uh, I tried everything that I could think of to fix and control my wife. At the height of her, I, I thought based on physical size alone, I should be able to control her. At the height of her drinking, she weighed 87 pounds. And I weighed more than that. <laughs> I couldn't control her. I couldn't control her. I told you I obsessed about my wife. I checked the distance from our house to all the local liquor stores. And then in the morning before I went to work, I checked my wife's speedometer and I checked it again when I came home because I wanted to figure out what liquor store she was buying her booze in. Now, I don't know what I was going to do with that information. <laughs> But it seemed very important at the time. I even tried to control my wife by withholding sex. That didn't work at all. She never even noticed. And I gave that up after about a day and a half. I quickly realized the problem wasn't that bad. Uh, my wife started having panic attacks. I didn't know what to do with her, so I took her to the family doctor. The family doctor didn't seem to know what to do with her, so uh, he sent her to a therapist. I took my wife to her first therapy session. She went in to talk to the therapist for the first 45 minutes. Then she came out, and I went in to talk to the therapist. And the therapist said, what do you think your wife's problem is? And I said, well, she drinks too much. And the therapist said, no, she has issues. And we'll work through the issues, and the drinking will go away. Well, I sent her off to the therapist. This was in the late 70s. Uh, it costs $50 a week for her to go see this therapist. That was a lot of money to me at the time. And finally, after six months, she came home and she said, the therapist would like to see you next week. So I went in and the therapist said, you know, Mr. Palmer, until you get your wife to quit drinking, I can't help her. <laughs> She never went back to see that therapist, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, this was a trained professor. This lady had diplomas all over her wall. And she said it was up to me to get her to quit drinking. I was responsible. Well, for the next several years, our marriage and our life together kind of circled the drain. I mean, we weren't going anywhere as a couple. And finally, I came home from work one snowy February. There was about, about eight inches of snow on the ground. I walked into my kitchen, and my wife was drunk. Now, I hear people in the al program say that when their spouse came home from work, they would run over and give them a kiss so they could smell their breath to see if they were drinking. I never had to do that, because when my wife drank, she put on lipstick, and she missed her lips. <laughs> she had it all over her 
mile. Hell, I could tell from down the street she was drunk. <laughs> and I said, I'm not living like this anymore. You're going to have to leave. She said, I'm not leaving. I said, oh, yes, you are. And I picked her up, and I carried her out and threw her in the snow. Well, it was like putting the cat out. She was back inside before I was. <laughs> But, you know, I was ashamed and embarrassed because I was raised that you never touch a woman. And that's where the family disease of alcoholism took me. I was trying to control another person. I couldn't even control myself. Well, my wife was back inside. She uh, made a phone call. A little while later, there was a knock on the door. I answered the door. It was my wife's friend. And she said, is she drunk again? Well, I was shocked. I didn't know that anybody else knew she drank but me. That was my secret. Anyway, I said yes. Her friend came in. Unbeknownst to me, her friend was married to an alcoholic. And she was carrying around in her purse the number for AA to give to her husband at an opportune time. Instead, she gave the number to my wife. And my wife made the call to AA that night. The next night, somebody came to the house and took my wife to her first AA meeting. Excuse me. When she came home, I sat down with her and I said, now what did you learn at your first AA meeting? <laughs> and she said, I learned you're sicker than I am and you need to go to Illinois. <laughs> That's the night I learned that all they do in AA is sit around and talk about us. <laughs> I went to my first Al-Anon meeting that Friday night. I walked in and there was about 35 women and four guys. And I got to tell you, I was intimidated. I mean, I had all the problems I could stand with one woman. I didn't need 35 more in my life. <laughs> but, you know, God gave me the gift of desperation, and I went in. I started talking to one of the guys. He was a few years younger than me, and he was very spiritual. And I tell you that because that became a large part of my early recovery, and it remains a large part of my recovery today. I talked to this guy quite a bit that night. He seemed like a pretty good guy, and we started going to meetings together. We went to all the local meetings. Eventually, I asked him to be my sponsor. And after a while, we decided to broaden our horizons. We thought we'd go to meetings all over the city of Pittsburgh. We lived a little distance apart, so we meet someplace in the middle and take one car to the meeting. On the way to the meeting, we started talking about my life and the events of my life. And it was through my sponsor's eyes that I began to see that there seemed to be a power greater than myself that was working in my life and had been working in my life all along. Because it seemed like every time I got into a jackpot, my life would go in a different direction. It was literally a turning point in my life. And six months down the road from that turning point, my life was in a much better place than it would have been had I stayed on the same path. And I began to see that God was working in my life. And you know, the funny thing is that I was there, I lived through it, I experienced it. I never saw God's hand in my life until my sponsor pointed it out. It's good to have a sponsor. It's good to have a sponsor. It was during this period of time I took the first three steps. But I stopped there because that fourth step scared me. I didn't want to look at me. You know, I was new in the program. And I found out the word new stands for nothing else works. 
And isn't that the truth? I tried everything I could think of to fix and control my wife. And finally, I ended up in al -Anon. How lame is that? <laughs> but nothing else worked. At my very first meeting, I learned about the three C's. I didn't cause the alcoholism. I couldn't control it. And I couldn't cure it. And when I could move that information from my head down to my heart, it started to lift a weight off my shoulders. Later on, I learned about the fourth C. I couldn't compete with alcohol. Alcohol was my wife's lover, her companion, her confidant, her seducer, her confessor, her best friend. It was her everything. I couldn't compete with alcohol on any level. I learned that alcoholism is a disease. Now, I had seen a sign in a bar room years earlier that said, alcoholism is a disease. Get your shots here. I thought it was a big joke. <laughs> but I truly came to believe that it was a disease. And not only was it a disease, it was a highly contagious disease. When somebody in your household suffers from alcoholism, everybody gets sick. Everybody. I learned it's easy to see what the alcohol is doing to the alcoholic. It's almost impossible to see what it's doing to us. I was talking to a lady at one of the early meetings, and I was telling her how I was obsessed with my wife and acting crazy and how my wife was falling down drunk. And she said, well, who's raising your kids? I said, what do you mean who's raising my kids? She said, well, you're obsessed with your wife and acting crazy. Who's raising your kids? For the first time, I realized my kids were raising themselves. Another early meeting I went to was on detachment. Somebody spoke for 10 or 12 minutes, and then we went around the room and shared. When it came to this one lady's turn to share, she said that when her husband and her were having an argument and he said something to push her buttons, she would say, I'm sorry you feel that way. And the argument was diffused. I thought, that's so simple. Why didn't I think of that? I'll use that in my life. A couple days later, when my wife and I were having an argument, and she said something to push my buttons, I said, I'm sorry you feel that way, asshole. <laughs> That's not what I learned in Al-Anon. <laughs> but what I did learn is if I want to detach, I have to detach from a point of strength. I can't detach from a point of weakness. Uh, you know, we talk about halt, hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. And I have to avoid these things because if I don't, I'll be vulnerable. I'll get sucked right into an argument. The way I became strong is I went to lots of meetings, I started working the steps with my sponsor, and I started to develop an intimate relationship with my higher power. And when I did these three simple things, I was able to say, I'm sorry you feel that way, dear. But you know that strength that I needed to detach with, that's not a one-trick pony. I could use that same strength for handling fear, compassion, decision-making, tolerance, patience, acceptance, a lot of the things that we talk about in the program. You know, when I came in down and on, I was a very angry individual. And that was fine with me because I thought anger was the perfect emotion for a man to have. And so if I was afraid, I'd get angry. If I... Uh, if I was frustrated, I'd get angry. If I was disappointed, I'd get angry. And besides, I was a construction worker. I couldn't go on a construction job site and tell a 280-pound iron worker, you really hurt my feelings. <laughs> and so for the first time in a lot of years, I started feeling my emotions. 
You know, those early meetings were uncanny. Every meeting seemed to be exactly what I needed. It didn't matter what the topic was. It was exactly what I needed. It wasn't until years later I figured out I was so sick it wouldn't matter what the meeting was on. It would have been exactly what I needed. I was in the program 16 months. I come home from work one Friday night. My wife wasn't home. Dinner time came and went, and she still wasn't home. Finally, about 6.30 or quarter to 7, the phone rang. I answered it. It was my wife. She informed me that she was on her way to California, and I was devastated. I found out the next day that she had run off with a guy that she met in AA. He left his wife, and they went out to California. And I needed to talk to somebody. So I tried to call my sponsor, but this was 1983. We didn't have cell phones at the time. I couldn't get a hold of them. And so I decided that I'd go out to my meeting early and maybe there'd be someone I could talk to. Now, the meetings back then all started at 9 o'clock. I went out about 8 o'clock. The only people that were there were five or six newcomers that were there for the newcomers meeting. The person who was supposed to chair the newcomers meeting didn't show up that night for some reason. Well, Alano newcomers meetings were very simple at the time. Alano had a series of six cassette tapes. And the person who chaired the meeting would open with the serenity prayer. He'd put the tape of the week in the cassette recorder. He'd play it when the tape was over, ask if there's any questions, and close the meeting with the Lord's Prayer. And I thought, well, I, I can chair the meeting, and maybe there'll be someone there that I could talk to when the meeting was over. And so I opened the meeting with the serenity prayer. I put the tape in the tape recorder. And in about 30 seconds, the tape recorder ate the tape. <laughs> and so I had to share with those newcomers my experience, strength, and hope. And at the end of that meeting, I felt significantly better. By trying to share with them hope, I found hope. And by trying to share with them strength, I found strength. And I learned that a very large portion of my own recovery depends upon me reaching out to help others. I don't know if any of those newcomers ever came back, by the way, but I felt significantly better. <laughs> well, my wife was gone, and I made a conscious decision that I was not going to let this thing that she did destroy my life. And so I decided I was going to do my fourth step. Al-Anon has a, a book. It's called The Blueprint for Progress. It's a how a lot of us in Al-Anon do our fourth step. I bought The Blueprint for Progress. I would come home from work. My kids and I would have dinner. And then I sat out on my deck and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. And this had two significant effects upon my life. The first was that it gave me the discipline to take the focus off what my wife had done and put it on me. There wasn't one question in that blueprint for progress about her. And the second thing is that I learned more out about myself than I ever would have known. You know, normal people don't ever look at themselves, especially if they're married to alcoholics. Alcoholics make sex as an easy target. You can blame them for everything. <laughs> but for the first time, I looked at me. And I found out I was a very frightened, very judgmental, very self-righteous person to name just a couple. Well, my wife was gone, and I continued to go to al -Anon. This one week, I was going to go up to see my sister. She lived up in New York. And my kids were staying at their grandparents'. Something came up, and I didn't go. I don't remember what it was, but I didn't go up. But I uh, went out to my Al-Anon meeting. 
I came home about 10.30 or quarter to 11, and there was a strange car in my driveway, and there were lights on in my house. I walked into my kitchen. Out of my living room walked this guy. All he had on was his underwear. Don't we just love it when we have an opportunity to work our program? <laughs> I'd like to tell you that that's what I did. <laughs> but I had what we call an Allen on a slip. <laughs> I tried to hurt him. Well, fortunately for him and fortunately for me, he was a little quicker than I was. And he ran out into the night in his tidy whities <laughs> I went into the living room. He had his clothes all neatly folded in a pile. I got a pair of scissors and cut them up. <laughs> and I guess my wife was upstairs getting a bath, getting cleaned up for him. So I couldn't catch him, but I went down in the driveway and I caught his car. And I lumped his car up a little bit. He was a salesman. He had all his sales books and all his sales paraphernalia in the back seat of the car. I took them all out and I threw them in the garbage can. And then I went up in the house and I got all my wife's clothing and I brought them down and put them in the back seat on top of the broken glass where the sales books used to be. Uh, he eventually came back he told me he was sorry. I agreed with him, <laughs> and I sent them on their way. Over the next several weeks, my wife called me numerous times. She told me how sorry she was for what she had done, and she said that all she wanted to do was come home and be my wife. And eventually I said, you can come home, but you have to get help for yourself first. So my wife went into a halfway house. She was in that halfway house for a short while, and I took her back. And she was home for a short while, and her and this fella, I called him my husband-in-law by now. <laughs> they took off and went back out to California. And I entered into the darkest period of my life. But I continued to go to Al-Anon. I went out to my home group one Friday night, and two carloads of people from a meeting across town that my sponsor and I used to go to came out to my home group to support me. That's the kind of love and support and understanding we have for one another in the program. After the meeting, we all went out to a, a restaurant. One of the people that came out to support me was a young lady that I really didn't know. I'd seen her around. I may have said hi to her a couple times, but I never had a conversation with her. And we happened to sit next to each other at the restaurant. We started talking. We found out we had a lot of things in common. I mean, they were simple things. Like she had three sisters and a brother named Joe, and I had three sisters and a brother named Joe. She, her mother's name was Betty. My mother's name was Betty. Uh, she was in the program about the same length of time that I was in the program. She'd been married about the same length of time that I had been married. And she had two teenagers, a girl and a boy, with the girl being the oldest. And I had the same thing. And we started comparing notes. You know, what do you do when this happens? And how do you handle this situation? And she seemed like a very nice person, and I asked her for a phone number. I called her up a couple days later, and I made a date with her. I took her out to dinner and a movie. I took her out and bought her a hamburger. Hey, I know how to treat a girl. <laughs> and the movie was about a drunk. I want her to feel comfortable, feel at ease, let her hair down. <laughs> And she's been my bride for the last 36 years. Oh. 
And I got to tell you, she is the most wonderful woman a man could have for a wife. Uh, you know, today I look at our marriage and I, I just know in my heart that God handpicked her for me. Well, my daughter had graduated from high school and she was seeing this guy that we didn't like. He was abusive. And the first thing you know, my daughter was pregnant and she had a little boy. Now, my new wife and I both love little kids. We loved them then, we love them today. And we used to get this little boy on Friday night to Sunday night from the time he was brand new out of the hospital, every weekend. And we'd take him to church with us on Sunday morning and my wife was holding him. And he kind of looked like me. He had the Palmer pumpkin head. <laughs> and so she was holding him in church this one morning, and the lady came over and said, I didn't even know you were pregnant. <laughs> and my wife only smiled. Anyway, uh, when he was, when this, our grandson was 13 months old, I got a call one afternoon from the Children and Youth Service. And the lady said, we got your grandson over here at the police station. Come pick him up. I went and picked him up. He had a dirty diaper and no shoes. And that's the way we got him. Over the next five years, the Children and Youth Service terminated the father's parental rights. My daughter signed her parental rights away. And my wife and I adopted him. Now, we were both in al and we knew how alcoholism seems to run in families. And so we wanted to make sure that we could, we were the best parents that we could be. I mean, he had a bad family tree on both sides of his family, and we wanted to make sure he grew up to be a responsible adult. And so we ate our meals together. We prayed at our meals. We prayed at night. My wife read to him every night. Uh, he was in Cub Scouts. He was in Little League. And along the way of raising him, we dropped out of al -Anon because we didn't have any, any alcoholism in our life. We thought we were cured. And we took this little boy to a child psychologist every couple years to make sure we were on the right track. He underwent this traumatic experience when he was a baby, and we wanted to make sure we were doing things right. He was an older boy for years, and when he was 12 years old, he started drinking and drugging. And you know, there's not another damn thing we could have done. This was a decision that he made. And when he started drinking and drugging, we entered the most insane period of our life. Uh, he didn't have any money to be buying drugs and alcohol, so he used ours. <laughs> I'd have $100 in my wallet, and I'd look, and there'd be $60 in there. And I'd say, were you in my wallet? He would get so upset that I would even ask him. <laughs> and then I'd say to my wife, "Did you? were you in my wallet? And she'd say, No. And I spent hours trying to figure out where I spent that $40. <laughs> this didn't happen once. It didn't happen twice. It seemed like it was happening all the time. Uh, my wife was blaming me. I was blaming her. She was pointing the finger at me. I was pointing the finger at her. I mean, he was a young teenager. He had to listen to his parents. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> My wife was constantly on the phone with the police, with the drug counselor, with the school counselor. And we were full of fear and guilt and shame and despair. And when our son was 15 years old, he went into AA. My wife and I knew we were in trouble, and we came right back to the rooms of Illinois. And the people were there for us. They loved us. They hugged us. 
They were glad to see us back. We weren't glad to see them, but I'll tell you, that's not who we wanted to be, where we wanted to be. But they, they just loved us, uh, even though we were as nutty as fruitcake by that time. Uh, I got back in the service because I was getting so much out of the program. I had this, this uh, feeling of gratitude, and I felt I needed to give something back to the program. Service allowed me to get out of myself and over myself. I met wonderful people in service. I met people all over the state of Pennsylvania. And I will tell you that the greatest period of growth that I've had in Al-Anon was when I was most involved in service. And uh, anyway, our son eventually graduated from high school. He went to AA all through high school. He never fell in love with it. After he graduated from high school, he decided that what he needed to do, he needed to, to uh, have his own apartment. So my wife and I furnished the apartment for him. He was in that apartment one month and he got tossed because he was drinking again. Uh, winter time was coming on. It was getting cold. It gets cold in Pittsburgh, by the way. <laughs> it was getting cold. And so he called up one day and said, do you think I could come out to the house and wash my clothes and take a hot shower? Well, he was our baby. He was our son. We never stopped loving him. And so I, my wife and I said, yes, you can do that. And then he said, do you think you could come and pick me up? I don't have any gas to put, or any money to put gas in my truck. So he told me where his truck was parked. I went and picked him up. He came out to the house. He washed his clothes. He took a hot shower. And my wife fixed a really nice hot supper. And after supper, he said, do you think I could spend the night? And we had to tell him no. I mean, it was hard. That was our baby. And so he gathered up his belongings, and I drove him back to where his truck was parked. And as he opened the door to get out, the cold night air rushed in, and I began to realize that my son, my baby, was going to spend the night out there in the cold. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. And as I drove home that night, I had tears running down my cheeks. And, you know, he doesn't remember a minute of it. He was in a blackout. But the pain I put myself through was just incredible. Well, he went back into AA that week, and we allowed him to come home and live. And it was with the understanding we wouldn't put up with any drugs or alcohol. And he was home for a while, and then he went out one night, he got himself arrested for public intoxication and fighting with a cop. And he lost the fight, by the way. <laughs> he was in jail. If you've never had that experience, they're allowed to collect phone call. He called for a week, and we wouldn't accept the charges. Instead, we went to lots of al meetings. We went to al meetings where we didn't know a soul. And the people were there for us. They loved us. They hugged us. They understood what we were going through. They were there for us. After a week, he got released. He came home. He decided that what he needed to do, he needed to reconnect with his biological mother. She was living out in California at this time. He made arrangements, and he went out to California. This was 2008. The economy out in California was terrible in 2008. He was out there for 11 months and couldn't find a job. And so he came out home with the understanding that we wouldn't put up with any drugs or alcohol. And he was drinking, and we knew it. We didn't have the heart to put him out. 
Finally, one afternoon, when my grandkids were over, they were three and four at the time, he OD'd on the living room couch. My wife called 911. Two police officers showed up before the paramedics got there, and me and a cop beat on my son's chest to keep his heart beating long enough for the paramedics to come. The paramedics came, they revived him, and they took him to the hospital. My wife and I gathered up his belongings. We took him down to the hospital and put him on his bed and said, you lost your home. By trying to give him a softer, kinder way, it damn near killed him. Uh, then my wife went home. My wife and I went home, and we knelt down, and we turned him over to God and said, God, please take care of him. Uh, Over the next several years, he lived on a lot of people's couches. They call that couch surfing. And when he wore out his welcome, he was living on the streets. When it got cold out, he went into a homeless shelter. Uh, we would talk to him once in a while, and every once in a while, we'd even see him. And we saw him this one day, and he pulled up his shirt, and he said, look at this. And he had these little red bite marks on his torso. They had bed bugs in the homeless shelter. And it would have been real easy to say, you can't live like that. You need to come home and live. But instead, I bought him a $7 can of bug spray. And he survived. He survived. While he was at the homeless shelter, he went to a methadone clinic. My wife and I were dead set against that. That was just another drug to us. But... Uh, Thank God he did, because there was a lot of bad heroin on the street at the time. He also, he got a job while he was at the, the uh, homeless shelter. Uh, he, he got some money. He got himself an apartment. We, my wife and I helped him furnish, you know, some things you just never learn. I don't know. <laughs> but we helped him furnish it. He met a girl seven years ago. He got married. Today, he goes to work every day. He pays his taxes. He bitches about his taxes, just like the rest of us. <laughs> but he's a productive citizen. Four years ago, he gave me the most beautiful little grandson. And I love that little boy. I had the privilege of watching him three days a week for the first four years of his life. And I said to him when he turned three, I says, I just love you to pieces. And he says, I love you together. <laughs> and all this is a direct result of my wife and I putting him out. Yeah, we put him out on the street and we turned him over to God, and God fixed him. God fixed him. Uh, if every time he fell down, I ran out and put a pillow under him so he wouldn't hit so hard, and then picked him up and dusted him off and put him back on his feet, what incentive would he have to change his behavior? It's only when he felt the consequences of his behavior was he able to change. You know, God changes our behavior in a lot of nice ways. He changes it through love and understanding and compassion and, and acceptance. And when all these nice ways fail, God changes our behavior through pain. When something hurts bad enough, you do something else instead. And when the, the pain of his, the, the consequences of his behavior became great enough, he did something else instead. Uh, we turned him over to God and God fixed him. I, I, I got to tell you, he didn't fix him in my time. I thought it should have happened a lot faster, but he, he's doing very well today. Uh, I told you I was, the worst part about living with alcoholism was loneliness. There simply was no one to talk to because when I tried to talk to somebody, 
I get responses like, I wouldn't put up with that. I'd put my foot, I'd throw the bum out. Or my favorite was, well, what you should have done. People that don't have their own alcoholic don't get it. They don't understand. But when I came into Al-Anon, people were talking about experiences that I could identify with. They were talking about feelings that I had had. And one night I broke down and I told a lady at the meeting what was going on in my home. And she did not say, I wouldn't put up with that or what you should have done. She said, I know. And when she said, I know, I was home. I was home. And I quickly realized that everybody in the meetings was there for the same reason. We'd all experienced it and all felt that pain. And I quickly understood that I could talk to the people in these rooms. If it's mentionable, it's manageable. If I can talk about my pain, it'll cut it in half. If I can talk about my frustration, it'll cut it in half. If I can talk about my, my uh, resentments, it'll cut it in half. If I can talk about my fear, it'll cut it in half. If I can talk about my joy, it'll multiply it. But when I leave things bottled up inside of me, it'll fester and poison me. It'll cause me to be bitter and angry and resentful. And I don't choose to live my life that way anymore. I want to live happy, joyous, and free. And I have found that I can live happy, joyous, and free by coming to the program, working the steps with my sponsor, and staying close to my higher power. You know, I've had a wonderful spiritual experience in al -Anon. When I came in, I learned three important things. I learned that God wanted me to be happy. I never knew that. I learned that God wanted only the very best for me. I never knew that either. And I learned that God loved me more than I will ever understand. Uh, I got a friend I go to meetings with. She says that the difference between me and God is God never thinks he's me. <laughs> I learned that too. I went to a meeting a while ago. There was a lady there that was having a bad week or a bad month. And she said, life isn't fair. And I thought about that for a few minutes, and I thought, thank God life isn't fair. If life was fair, I'd have to start giving things back. There's nothing I've ever done to deserve the wonderful wife I have. There's nothing I've ever done to deserve my wonderful grandchildren. If I knew grandchildren were as wonderful as they are, I would have had them first. <laughs> And there's nothing I've ever done to deserve my wonderful al -Anon family. You are my people. You are the people that loved me when I was unlovable. You are the people that accepted me when I was unacceptable. And you are the people that understood me before I understood myself. Uh, you know, al -Anon's a 12-step program. And every one of those 12 steps is a spiritual experience. I don't have time to talk about all the 12 steps, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the third step. The third step says, made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood them. You know, when I turned my will and my life over to the care of God, God came all the way down to where I was at and accepted me right there. I didn't have to get righteous. I didn't have to get pious. I didn't have to get holy. He accepted me right where I was at. And um, I believe that, that third step is about God carrying our burdens. I turn my will in my life over to God. My will is my mind, and my life is the world and the people in it. It makes no sense for me to turn my will over, my mind, 
and hold on to my kids and try to fix them. I need to turn everybody over to God. You know, one of my hobbies is stained glass. I was in a stained glass store years ago, and there was a sign there that said, we repair stained glass windows, and the cost is $10 an hour. Then the sign said, if you watch, it's $50 an hour, and if you help, it's $100 an hour. <laughs> I have two alcoholic sons, and if I can turn them over to God and let, and let God take care of them, I get off cheap, spiritually and emotionally. If I have to watch to make sure God's fixing them the way I think they should be fixed, I pay a big price. And if I have to take them back off God and try to fix them myself, I pay a huge price. Uh, you know, my life today with God is God and I are in a rowboat. God's on the rudder, that's the steering part. And I'm on the oars. That's the, the work part. And it's a beautiful day. We're going all over the lake. We're having a ball. Life is good. Life is, is wonderful. And then I say to God, hey, how about trade me places? Because God says, sure, because he gives me a free will. And so I get on the rudder and God gets on the oars. And then we just sit there because God don't row. <laughs> I got a friend that says you can't pray your socks on. You may want your socks on, but you better put them on yourself because God doesn't put socks on and he doesn't row. You know, I've come to the understanding that when I turn my sons over to God to let, to let God take care of them, it's not like I'm turning them over to the enemy. God loves my sons more than I could ever love them. And I know today that it's God's job to take care of my sons. But I also know it's my job to get out of God's way. I was... Uh, I, I, my oldest son today has two years of good AA sobriety. And I am so happy for him. And I want to thank the members of AA for helping him get sober. I tried everything I could think of to fix and control him, and nothing worked. I was a total failure. But AA got a hold of him. And now he's the treasurer of his group. And I am so happy and so proud of him. And I had nothing to do with it. And I thank you. I don't know why it is that we can't help our loved ones, but somebody else can help them. And I promise you this, if one of your loved ones comes to Allen on and I'm around, I'll be there to help them. I went to a meeting number of years ago, it was close to where I grew up. And there was uh, an AA meeting there at the same time. I went into the AA meeting to get a cup of coffee. I used to have the attitude that they shared the disease with me, at least they can do is share a cup of coffee. <laughs> and so I went in and I ran into three fellows that I used to drink with in high school. And we stood there and reminisced, and then it was time for the meeting to start. And I took my cup of coffee, and I walked down the, the hall toward the Illinois meeting. And as I walked down the hall, I said, said to myself, why me? Why am I in the rooms of Illinois and not in the rooms of AA? What was the difference? How did I dodge the bullet? And as I continued to walk down the hall, I began to realize what a privilege, what an absolute privilege to be a member of Al-Anon. And then I thought, you know, with that privilege comes responsibility. It's up to me to make sure that the program of, uh, of AA is, or Al-Anon is here for the next person. I got a little granddaughter, and I love her to pieces, 
but she is such a fixer and such a manipulator, and she makes excuses for her little brother. <laughs> She's going to be in these rooms someday. <laughs> it's up to me to make sure the program of the 12 Steps and 12 Traditions is here for her. Yeah, that little granddaughter, when she was three years old, she was over at my house. And it was a summer day, and the sun was out. It was warm. And so I took her for a walk down in the woods behind my house. And we walked and walked and walked. And then we came across a log laying across the path. And we sat down to rest. And I said to her, Megan, do you know where you are? And she said, no. And I said, do you know which way home is? And she said, no. And I said, well, you must be lost. She said, I'm not lost. I'm with you. And I will tell you, I'm not lost anymore either. I'm with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.